Brian, I want to get started. Go ahead. Do you want to just call it? Okay. If, if I could have your attention, please. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome to the Concord Coalition's annual event. Warren and I are going to um, make a couple of remarks before you get to the people that you came for. I would like to acknowledge uh, a few people. First of all, Alan Greenspan, who is the only person at, at the head table who still has power. Uh, this is the largest aggregate group of has-beens, I think, in uh, <clears throat> recent New York experience. I would like to acknowledge the work done by the people who put this together. And there are a lot of people, and I'd like to do it in a kind of representative fashion, to acknowledge Amy Gabala, who's, where is Amy? <clears throat> who organized this, but all the people who are responsible for making it a success, and Gene Friedman, Steve Friedman, Bud Meyerhoff, and in particular, the man who kept the Concord Coalition alive for a long time, Pete Peterson. Pete? I'd also like to acknowledge the people who are the staff, the volunteers, and the state coordinators. And not only do they give us the muscle to have impact, but in particular, have given us the intellectual integrity in the proposals that we've made. And the way to do that is to recognize and to thank Martha Phillips, who's our executive director. I would just like to um, make two small points, and Warren's going to get up and we, we may say uh, similar things or different things, whatever. Two points. One, I have spent a good part of these last several years traveling the country and speaking on the issues that concern us this evening. I was in Mississippi earlier today, and if I could distill these experiences, what I tell people, no matter where that would be, is that I believe that the American people today fit a certain prototype. The vast majority of Americans, I believe, fit a paradigm that I would refer to as the passionate center. And that passionate center has four components. One, the American people, by instinct, are socially inclusive and recognize this is a multicultural society and it's got to be made to work. Sec <laughs> Most of the applause came from the has-beens at the head table. I appreciate the uh, recognition. Secondly, apropos of what we're here about tonight, the American people are fiscally conservative. They want a balanced budget. They have to do it in their homes, in their businesses, in their local and state governments, and they demand that Washington do the same thing, not just for economic reasons. In fact, that's the minor part of it, but because of the overwhelming sense of generational responsibility that what drives the Concord Coalition more than anything else is the, the parent-child bond, the angst that people have about the world that their kids and grandkids are going to inherit. Thirdly, this passionate center is pro-environment. My generation, I think, has come to learn that, but particularly the young, for them, the environment must be protected. That's a given. And they will accept no withdrawal from that commitment. And finally, the American people demand campaign reform. Those four components, no matter where I go, no matter who I speak to, 
I believe represent where most Americans are. Our task tonight is the second, which is the issue of fiscal responsibility, or as some of us would argue, generational responsibility. Just one word to those who are putting this budget together. I commend the Republicans for their courage. Whether you agree or disagree, the fact is drawing a line in the sand, saying in seven years we're going to balance this budget, had to have been done. And people like John Kasich and Pete Domenici and others, I think, have shown great courage. The problem, the flaw, is the tax cut. The proposed tax cut delegitimizes all the good work that's being done. It's bad economics, and therefore it is also, in my judgment, bad politics. It has no support either among the editorial writers or the American people. And the reason it doesn't is that it takes the budget debate which to succeed and be accepted by the American people requires a sense of shared sacrifice. And the tax cut has as its impact cuts that are far more draconian than necessary and sets up not an aura of shared sacrifice, but the worst of all possible outcomes, winners and losers in which the people who are going to be vulnerable and sense that they are the losers will resent what has happened. And that is quite different than the American people that I see out there. So I call upon the Congress to pass a balanced budget. I call on the President to veto it and let them get together, do entitlements, as Pete would describe it, affluence test entitlements. Leave the programs alone that are future, college loans, those kinds of things. In the Medicare field, affluence test, managed care, those kinds of things. But when you start going after programs that affect the vulnerable, that which keeps us together, I think, is destroyed. The President, I believe, wants to do the right thing. I believe the leadership of the House and Senate wish to do this, the same. I think they should forget about the polling data, forget about the campaign that's coming up, do what's right for the American people, and that, in the end, will be the better politics. Warren? Let me join Paul in thanking Steve Friedman, our dinner chairman, uh, Alan Greenspan, and Paul Vokla, who just come back from a long trip, who joined us this evening. Uh, let me pay particular homage to Pete Peterson. Uh, when we uh, put this together uh, in the fall of 1992, uh, never did I dream uh, that several years later, we'd have membership all over this country, every state, nearly every congressional uh, district, Many members of Congress, either members or most interested in what we're doing, including the Speaker, who asked us to have two visits with him in the last six weeks, and we gave him our views. Uh, the coalition has received enormous uh, attention from the media, which is so vital. And I want to thank all of you here tonight for supporting uh, this organization, which runs on a very tight budget uh, all over this country. During the last two and a half years, uh, I've just had a... Uh, a very enriching experience to travel this country with Paul on college campuses, senior citizens' uh, homes, groups of uh, businessmen, groups of ordinary Americans. And the enrichment has come from, I think, their abiding faith that somehow uh, this country uh, will straighten out these problems and straighten them out soon. Uh, their unhappiness with the current political parties I think comes from quite the opposite of what the parties have thought for a long time. And that is that somehow it is dangerous to tell the American people the truth. One of the reasons that the perception of deficits 
being caused by things like foreign aid and congressional perks and so forth in every poll is that neither party has been willing to lay it on the line until very recently. Now, the coalition has tried uh, mightily to influence uh, the process this year, and I must say uh, that the thing that pleases us the most is the willingness of both the Republicans and the President although there is some triangulation here, to use the president's term. I'm not quite sure whether Democrats in Congress are aboard yet, but certainly the president and the Republican leadership have finally adopted Pete Peterson's affluence testing. And uh, Pete didn't invent it, but nobody has talked about it ad nauseum more than Pete Peterson. <laughs> and he certainly has made converts out of most of us in the coalition. Uh, let me say that that one of the uh, remarkable things about politics this year, it has truly developed into more of an art form than I think ever before. Because you see, if you really sit down and write down two columns as to what the president has said and what the Republicans are saying, they really are not that far apart. The president was the first one who said there ought to be a tax cut. And by the way, Paul, I agree with you totally on that. But there will be a tax cut this year because the president wanted a tax cut. And the Republicans said, well, we can't let a Democratic president be in front of us with a tax cut, so we'll, we'll do it better. And everybody's outbidding everybody else. But the fact is, both parties agree on a tax cut. The president agrees on a balanced budget, and so do the Republicans. They have a difference on time. The president believes Medicare has to be reformed. The Republicans feel the same way, as do the, Republic, the Democrats in the, in the Congress. And, and quite frankly, when I hear about the coming train wreck, what I've said in answer to questions as recently as this morning to a large group who I addressed, I said, look, there won't be a train wreck. There may be a few cars off the track, but they'll get them back on soon enough. Because what is going to come out of this for the first time since we tried it with Graham Rudman in 1985, the first time that we ever really had a downward decline, at least for three years, this year something far more significant is going to happen. There will be put in place some permanent reforms, I hope they're permanent, on Medicare, Medicaid, and welfare. I agree with Paul that if fairness is not part of this, then it will not last very long, and that is why he is so right on this whole issue of tax reductions. But having said that, I think what they will do is they will compromise on smaller tax cuts, maybe some modification of the Medicare and Medicaid reforms. They will essentially freeze the budget of the discretionary programs and let it grow with inflation. And for the first time since 1985, the financial markets around the world will look at the American fiscal situation and decide that we truly are on a downward path with our deficits, finally. That's important to us, but it is of great significance to our children and our grandchildren because, you know, when you look at the current numbers of deficits hitting the $300 billion mark in the year 2000, you realize that much more of that and this economy and our standard of living and our strength as a nation would be severely tested if it went unchallenged. So we're delighted you're here tonight to support the effort. Uh, you know, uh, someone one at, once asked me if, you know, this coalition is dedicated only to eliminating the deficit. I said, well, you've got it a little backwards. We're, yes, we're for eliminating the deficit because what we really want to do is to have an economy that grows in an increasingly competitive world with decreasing long-term interest rates, more capital for investment at a lower cost, and more jobs for Americans. That's what we're for, and getting the deficit down to zero is what we think is important. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. <laughs> Consult my program here because the, uh, we have decided to do away with an MC tonight, so we're, we're all doing part of it. Yes, I have a great pleasure to introduce Pete Peterson. He needs little introduction, but I just want to say something before I get up, Pete. When we started this coalition in the fall of 1992, it was remarkable what Pete Peterson did to put it together. Paul and I get a lot of credit for this, but the truth is that Pete brought together a group of very distinguished citizens from around this country. We sat with him in his office. We had several meetings. We decided to go ahead, and Pete was really the spark that ignited the existence of this coalition. And it has been a great pleasure for Paul Songus and Warren Rudman to get to know this man, but even a greater pleasure to work with him. Thank you, Pete.
Well, in this uh, mutual admiration testament, let me say that at a dinner that's honoring patriots, I don't know two Americans more deserving than our co-chairman, Senators Rudman and Songus, for the title of Great Patriots in America, and I salute you both gentlemen. <clears throat> you know, it's rare indeed, and I suspect unprecedented, that two such uncommon Americans as Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan would receive these awards on successive years. And perhaps it's even rare that two such uncommon Americans share so many qualities in common. And permit me to briefly illustrate this. In the first place, I think it is safe to say that both Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan are towering figures in American life. Paul Volcker is a six foot seven towering figure. And Alan Greenspan, it looks like about a six foot towering figure. But in any meaningful sense of the word, they are both towering figures because they tower over so many of us. Second, both Alan Greenspan and Paul Volcker are people that are devoted to firm principle in a time when an ever diminishing number in public life seem devoted to such principles. Now this is not the time to make invidious comparisons to other persons in current public life. So permit me to go back 30 years to make a point. I was in business in Chicago, <clears throat> and my senator from Illinois was Senator Everett Dirksen. He had promised to support a position on an issue that was so central that I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> but when it came time to vote, he switched positions totally. So being as upset as I was, I went to see the senator. And he said to me in his trademark, deep, Dirksen-esque, you know, voice, Pete, you are probably wondering if I am a man of high principle. I said, Senator, now that you mention it, the thought had occurred to me, yes. He said, Pete, I am a man of high principle. And I want you to know that my first principle is total flexibility. <laughs> Now, this is not the first principle or any principle of either Alan Greenspan or Paul Volcker. Third, both Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan have a quality that I think is required of every great chairman of the Federal Reserve, a gift for what we used to call constructive ambiguity, or one might say pur purposeful obfuscation. Now, as firm as these principled men are, these great chairmen of the Fed know how carefully their words are watched and how easily they can have unintended consequences. Again, unlike so many in public life today, these two both know the great virtue of discretion and the ability to avoid saying whatever's on their mind just because somebody asked them. Now, Alan's techniques have been a little different from Paul's. Um, but though the purpose seems to be the same. In Paul's case, you may remember, whenever a potentially sensitive question was going to be asked by some senator, for example, what's the direction of interest rates or the value of the dollar, Paul would give new meaning to the phrase blowing smoke. <laughs> when a senator would ask him such a question, Paul, as you may recall, would light a cigar and literally blow smoke, which added a physical fog to the rhetorical fog that he was intentionally creating. Now, Alan Greenspan uses other techniques. Let me use some metaphors from some athletic techniques that Alan uses. Let's take tennis. The chairman is a lefty, physically speaking, of course. Um, <laughs> Now, if you play tennis with the chairman, you would naturally expect him to play left-handed, which indeed he does virtually all of the time. However, and it is a very big however, at a decisive moment in the game, 
he will suddenly switch to the right hand in a totally unexpected move. It totally disorients his opponent, and he always wins that decisive point. <laughs> now, if you're a golf player, I have another example. If you play golf with Ellen, his central banker personality comes out in other ways. For example, the last time I played golf with him, he may recall that on the first hole, if you have a 12-inch putt, he will say, of course, Pete, take it. Take it as a gimme. However, should the same situation occur on the 18th hole, in which the stakes are much larger, he waits until the moment just before you're ready to pick it up and will say something like, I think it's better that you putt this one, Pete. <laughs> so that element of Greenspan, Greenspan psychological surprise keeps his skilled opponents off guard giving them a feeling that I think is shared by many of the large hedge fund managers that I know. Finally, because both of these distinguished Americans have in common that they are true patriots, for many years their love of country, their heartfelt concern for the public good, has greatly transcended the far more typical and perhaps grubbier preoccupations that most of us have with money and other material needs. And of course, it was that reason that Paul Volcker was named the first economic patriot last year. Paul, in turn, will give Alan Greenspan the more fulsome introduction that he deserves. But Paul, I would like to express our deep appreciation to you, not simply for your distinguished public service to our country, but for your many contributions as a director of the Concord Coalition. It's my great pleasure to present Paul Volcker. Paul. Well, thank you, Pete, ladies and gentlemen. I must say, I, I want to speak on behalf of Alan, that we resent this talk about obfuscation in our public statements. You just don't understand how difficult it is to explain reality and all its complexities and nuances. And to give you a direct answer to these questions would be the equivalent of a falsehood. <laughs> the fact is, even chairman of the Federal Reserve Board don't know which way interest rates are going. Well, let me say, Pete, your comparisons remind me of another time I had the very heavy responsibility of introducing Alan Greenspan. It happened to be at another large New York dinner a few years ago, a dinner at which, at an equivalent affair some years earlier, I had been honored. But I was the chairman of the dinner at that time, and as the chairman, I had been handed at the beginning of the dinner a sheet comparing the success of that dinner with past dinners of the same organization. And I have to tell you, in every significant category, attendance, total tables, special tables, receipts, I think even the number of courses on the menu, the Greenspan record stood out without parallel. And with all the experience of the Concord Coalition, that is true of the dinner tonight. Now, at one point, I thought I could take solace in the fact that you have to be careful with all these financial records. And of course, over time, they increase with inflation. It may not be a real result. But since then, I have to face the simple fact that our guest tonight has the record of presiding over the lowest rate of inflation of any of his predecessors, at least for the last 60 years, which is as far back as I could trace the record this afternoon. In fact, it's occurred to me, Alan, with that record of success, why was it you felt necessary a few months ago to claim the consumer price index actually overstated the cost of living? 
It occurred to me that maybe you wanted to make clear that any increase in the price of this dinner ticket reflected quality improvement, not inflation. Now, I don't want to cut into any more time this evening from our distinguished speaker, but I do want to emphasize a few things about this extraordinary man. I'm sure most of you know Alan has been, was for decades, a respected pioneer and practitioner of business economics, one of those few men that made this a real profession, leading his own firm, Townsend Greenspan. During that period, he was the director of some of the most prestigious companies in the United States, but through it all, he had a consistent interest in public service. He is particularly remembered as chairman of the National Commission on Social Security Reform, where he had to worry about some of these issues uh, more than 10 years ago, and a member of commissions on the all-volunteer armed force and on financial structure and regulation, just to begin to suggest the breadth of his interests. But for all of that, it's a matter of particular pride to some of us that he's a New Yorker, born and bred. Somehow he made it all the way down from Washington Heights to Washington Square to get his bachelor's and master's degree at NYU. A quarter century later, he managed to get his PhD. Now the fact is, the usual practice of economists is to first get the PhD and then aspire to be chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Alan did it the other way around. I leave it to all of you to ponder the significance <laughs> of that fact. In any event, I also know that he is the first PhD to be chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Whether because of or despite that fact, he has provided consistent leadership, producing the best record of consistent growth and stability within living memory. For chairman of the Federal Reserve, I have to tell you there can be no greater tribute. I also have to say that through his illustrious career, as best I know it, I've always understood, Alan, that you are indeed against deficits. In anticipation of the fact that you will repeat that conviction this evening, I am delighted to present to you the Economic Patriots Award, if it's around here. <laughs> if you will assume the podium and the rostrum, we all congratulate you on your long years of public service and what you are doing currently. Tell us how to produce a surplus. <laughs> I waved that trophy around because uh, I'd always been uh, thinking of the possibility that someday, in some way, uh, I will end up uh, winning a tournament, either in golf or tennis. And uh, it became pretty obvious to me that uh, uh, with my handicap in golf, it wasn't a number, it was my swing. It wasn't going to happen in golf. But there is an interesting trend that... Uh, may be emerging. I've been uh, tracing the quality of my tennis since I actually started playing at a rather elderly age on the White House tennis court in 1974. And there's no question that I've improved year by year. And as economists are prone to do, you extrapolate. And I've concluded that I will join the professional tennis tour at the age of 104. I'm sorry I have to make a speech. I was really enjoying all of this wonderful tribute, which uh, uh, is better than a, a kick in the ear, I must tell you. Uh, but needless to say, that uh, it is really a great pleasure to be with all of you tonight. and. Uh, uh, two of my favorite senators who uh, uh, 
unfortunately decided they didn't like what they were doing over there to everyone's loss. But uh, it's turning out that uh, when you've got extraordinary capabilities, wherever you are, you resurface, and indeed they have. And gentlemen, it's really uh, an extraordinary compliment to you what you have done with Paul and Pete to this really magnificent organization. I am honored to receive the Economic Patriot Award. It was especially fitting that you chose to present the first such award to Paul Volcker, who courageously and successfully waged a fight against inflation when it was at its most virulent. Today it is easy, but I remember coming down to Washington and visiting with Paul when you didn't know how it was all going to come out. And I can tell you, it was an extraordinary event to visit with him and to watch how somebody, knowing what he was dealing with, was able to so effectively function in an atmosphere which is not conducive to that. I don't think that there are many people who understand what Paul contributed to this country as much as I do, because I've sat in his office, and I've sat in his chair, and I've seen the types of things that he had to confront. And uh, what we have got is, in, to a very large extent, the result of the efforts and activities which he brought to bear, and the economy that we see, see today uh, is to a substantial extent, the result of what Paul and his colleagues were able to do with that extraordinary inflationary acceleration which existed in the latter part of the 1970s and which had, had it not been reined in, the issues which we would be discussing today would not be the budget deficit, which is a relatively civilized concept. We'd be talking about the stability of our society. So, Paul, if I were drinking tonight, which I am not, I'd raise my glass to you, but if I were to drink, I'd become inordinately clear, and that's a mistake, needless to say. <laughs> As you all know, since its founding in 1992, the coalition has been in the forefront of efforts to educate the public about the importance of reducing the federal budget deficit. Your work has contributed in no small measure to the growing public recognition of this issue. The greater public awareness, in turn, is a driving force in the efforts now underway to restore balance to the federal budget. The progress this year in coming to grips with the budget deficit has been truly extraordinary. And I must say I remain quite optimistic that the President and the Congress will agree on a program to bring the budget back into balance in the reasonably near future. That sentiment is also evident in the financial markets where long-term interest rates have fallen this year, in part because of the growing expectation that a credible multi-year plan for deficit reduction will be adopted. The decline in rates in turn has helped stimulate private, interest-sensitive spending, lending support to economic activity. If for some unforeseen reason the political process fails and agreement is not reached, it would signal that the United States is not capable of putting its fiscal house in order with serious adverse consequences for financial markets and economic growth. It is difficult to overstate the historic importance of the current initiative. Indeed, the intensity of the discussions and controversy surrounding them attest to their seriousness. If the discussions were subdued, 
I would be concerned that the current deficit at deficit reduction was a mirage, as too many in the past regrettably turned out to be. Our economic prospects in coming years will, hin will hinge on our ability to increase national savings and to invest that savings wisely. Making a serious commitment to balancing the budget within the next several years is an essential first step, but only a first step. Making good on our commitment by resisting the temptation to depart from that path will be a significant challenge. For example, the budget plans of both the Congress and the administration envisage sharp reductions in real discretionary spending in the aggregate over the next several years. However, the specific programmatic changes to implement those reductions must be made in the annual appropriations process and thus important decisions affecting the years after 1996 will fall to future Congresses and administrations. Should the deficit, for whatever reason, not drop as much as projected, additional measures will be required. That prospect has led many to favor the adoption of so-called look-back mechanisms that would be invoked if certain budget targets were not satisfied. Such a mechanism, for example, could provide for automatic programmatic cuts in the future if past spending had exceeded its target. Provided the current political support for a balanced budget is sustained, as I suspect it will be, look-back arrangements could improve the predictability of the outcomes associated with fiscal policy actions. The current efforts at fiscal restraint should perceptibly lower the track of spending as we enter the 21st century. Nonetheless, further actions will have to be taken to address the effects of currently foreseeable long-run demographic changes. As you know, these changes suggest the reemergence of trends towards higher deficits as we move through the first half of the next century. We can, of course, do little to alter the demographic forces and train. We can, however, remove the projected drain on saving and investment that chronic budget deficits will entail. Furthermore, we should think seriously about moving the budget into surplus in the early part of the next century to help foster the accumulation of productive assets to meet the retirement needs of today's working generation. Timely actions on the budget can help to lift the size of future output above that implied by the current pace of capital formation and the current trend in productivity. Indeed, this is one of the few instances in which we have the luxury of being able to foresee a distant problem that a thoughtful policy response might ameliorate. While implementation of this year's initiatives clearly will help in lowering the overall current services deficit projected for the first part of the 21st century, actions to deal with that deficit more fully will be better designed and far easier to implement the sooner the issue is addressed. Laws enacted with effects delayed for 15 to 20 years are likely to be decidedly more rationally constructed than when a crisis is much closer at hand. Moreover, putting taxation and benefit structures in place well in advance would enable our citizens to plan better for their futures. Last month, the finance ministers and central bank governors of the group of 10 industrial countries released a study by their deputies that examined the relationships among saving, investment, 
and real interest rates. The study concluded that long-term interest rates in the major industrial countries adjusted for inflation expectations have risen by approximately a full percentage point on average since the 1960s. It attributed the rise in real rates mainly to a decline in the overall saving rate, which in turn was driven largely by substantial increases in budget deficits in virtually all major industrial countries. This is of particular concern because over the longer run, upward movements in real interest rates by suppressing private investment and raising the cost of federal government debt can add to pressures from the political system toward central bank monetary accommodation and inflation. For sound reasons, markets are skeptical of anti-inflation pledges from high deficit countries, and this skepticism elevates long-term rates. In the shorter run, the ties among deficits, real interest rates, economic activity, and inflation are much looser. In the United States, for example, in the last decade and a half, inflationary pressures have been reduced despite historic high budget deficits and debt accumulation. A number of factors have been involved. The key element, of course, has been monetary policy, which gradually suppressed inflationary pressures beginning in 1979 with Paul. But the appropriate containment policy would have been far more difficult to maintain were it not for the sizable increase in imported savings reflected in our widening current account deficit, which largely offset the sharp drop in domestic saving that was a consequence of rising budget deficits. Had the additional foreign source of funds been unavailable, domestic financial strains would surely have been greater and political support for anti-inflationary policy far weaker. The ready availability of imported capital has facilitated domestic investment in efficiency-enhancing equipment, particularly in new computer-related technologies. Greater use of these technologies, in turn, has helped to restrain costs and contributed to improved price performance. However, we cannot depend on imported capital, that is a current account deficit, to offset low domestic saving indefinitely. As the G10 study indicates, even though globalization has led to large capital flows across national boundaries, domestic investment has remained highly dependent on domestic saving. This is likely to continue to be the case. Therefore, unless the budget deficit is brought down before foreign funds become increasingly costly, domestic investment will be impaired, economic growth will slow, and pressures on monetary policy to inflate could reemerge. I can assure you that the Federal Reserve recognizes that subdued inflation, along with balanced budgets and a further freeing of competitive forces, is a key to the fortunes of the economy as we move into the 21st century. To be sure, we as a, so we as a society shall continue for some time to face difficult questions about how to ensure that all segments of our society are afforded opportunities to participate in the greater prosperity. But the improvements in the economic climate that seem to be in train should provide the macro stability and micro incentives needed to foster the investments in human capital that will help redress the imbalances that have concerned all of us in recent years. Before closing, I would like to address a collateral issue 
that is related to budget deficits and is often employed regrettably as a device to obscure the true extent of deficit spending. I refer to federal government capital budgeting and the debate about whether it would be useful for the unified budget to distinguish between capital expenditures which support the creation of assets yielding services over an extended period and those that are associated with current consumption. Capital budgeting is a concept that has merit. It can provide useful information about the way a government's activities are affecting overall saving and investment, and more broadly, the economy's longer-run growth prospects. In addition, by highlighting investments that expand our future productive capacity, it can help us make sensible decisions about how the burden of repaying government debt should be spread across generations of taxpayers. But implementing the concept is fraught with significant difficulties for public policy. Even in the private sector, the distinction between capital and current expenditures has not always been clear. For example, many I items such as R&D, some corporate software, and some personnel technical training are routinely expensed. However, market prices suggest that they are income earning and thus should be capitalized and added to the balance sheet in support of debt. As I indicated in a speech before the Economic Club of Chicago a couple of weeks ago, the rising market to book value of corporate equity is probably indicative in part of an undervaluation of private capital investment outlays and incidentally of the gross domestic product. In the private sector, there are at least some market signals that are useful in gauging the value of corporate assets. Unfortunately, in the public sector, the market approach is probably infeasible. In concept, one might think that financial markets would value the debts of the government more highly, that is, require lower interest rates, if they were incurred in the creation of a national asset base that expands the economy's potential to produce output, income, and tax revenues. That is, if they create the wherewithal for repayment. Regrettably, however, the complexity of filtering out the various factors that determine the rate of interest the Treasury has to pay make such an evaluation exceptionally difficult, and any signals we could extract are unlikely to be very useful. Under the circumstances, the distinctions among types of federal spending are fuzzy, and decisions about classification are likely to be somewhat arbitrary. For example, one might argue that federal outlays on education increase skills, enhance the income earning capabilities of our workforce, and hence produce federal taxes as a measured return on the education outlay. Or, still a step further, our military spending, and I do not limit it to equipment, enhances the security of our nation and as a consequence, protects our private capital stock both here and abroad. Is this not a real flow of insurance services comparable to the income produced from private R&D, for example? Where should the line be drawn? I'm also concerned that the temptation to designate an expenditure as a capital outlay would be very hard to resist because such a designation would remove it from the restraint that would be imposed on other spending. Simply shifting some outlays to a capital budget might also create the illusion of a move towards surplus in the current budget that could lull us into a complacency about our fiscal affairs that we might live to regret. 
Accordingly, unless and until the practical issues are resolved, it would not, in my judgment, be prudent to create a capital budget for Treasury financing. Finally, I want to conclude by commending the Concord Coalition for its work over the past several years. You should take great pride in the heightened attention to the federal budget this year. But much remains to be done, and I expect your wisdom, insights, and determination to remain a force in addressing the fiscal challenges in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. We'll give you a brief breather and direct the first few questions at uh, uh, the Senators and uh, Pete Peterson, who labor under no uh, institutional requirement to be ambiguous at all. Um, senators, to the front-end um, loaded tax cuts and the back-loaded spending cuts, which appear to be taking shape, temper your optimism about the um, determination of Congress to stick with this program. Yeah. First, let me just uh, <coughs> tell you all that uh, Paul had a very early engagement in Boston and had to catch the last shuttle. And uh, the program is supposed to be ending about now, so I, I, I guess he's coming back for a couple of minutes, is he? All right. Let me, uh, let me just uh, take half of that and let Paul comment. I think uh, Alan Greenspan touched on it uh, as well as uh, anyone could uh, in his remarks. Uh, it is one thing to adopt a long-range policy which contains numerous assumptions, assumptions of interest rates, employment rates, unemployment rates, uh, savings rates. All of those things have to be put in this budget uh, to come up with the numbers that they've arrived at for the seven years. And then each succeeding Congress much, must take that budget plan each year and adopt the discretionary spending caps as well as all the other things that are in there. That's a terrific problem. And you might say that could be discouraging. Now, let me tell you why I'm not discouraged. Uh, uh, I believe that there is a new law operating in this country, or maybe it's an old law we're just noticing more of. I call it the law of imminence, I-M-M-E-N-E-N-C-E, -E -E, simply meaning that the American people uh, tend to want to stand in front of a train until it's almost upon them and will jump aside at the last moment to avoid being run over. Uh, the law of imminence has occurred this year with Medicare, something that we have all known uh, we have known for 10 years, suddenly is on the front page of the newspaper and on the nightly news. Medicare is about to go broke. When people heard that, danger was imminent, and that's not changing. So the Congress will have to follow through, or else they will have some enormous problems leading to the kind of uh, horrible things that Alan alluded to that would be possible. Paul? Well, if I had known that Warren was going to speak so well I would have left to catch my plane. Okay. With past First experiences, nice I couldn't be sure. All year, so, uh, the fact is, in politics, you get elected by saying yes, <clears throat> not by saying no. The second fact is, with the current economy, we should be in massive surplus. This is when we should be paying off the debt. And my concern is that unless somehow there's a constituency to demand responsibility won't happen. The remarkable thing is the American people, for example, in the tax cut, tell the pollsters, two to one, three to one, don't give us a tax cut, take the money and balance the budget. Despite the fact that virtually every leader in both parties is saying to them, you deserve a tax cut. So we're not asking for leadership here. Some fellowship uh, would be appropriate. And it seems to me that you cannot presume greatness on the part of those who seek election. And ultimately, it's up to the American people to demand responsibility, to recognize that the greatest responsibility of a voter is to the kids and grandkids they're brought into this world. If that means some sacrifice in the short term, they should demand it. And when they get pandered to, they should be insulted. They should be offended. 
And it seems to me that what we've seen in the last couple of months in both parties is a remarkable capacity to pander in a way that sets New World's records, and I, for one, find it offensive. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Pete Peterson, um, you, you're on record as saying that Social Security has to be on the budget table and that Social Security will so soon run huge annual deficits. Uh, given that um, it's currently running annual surpluses and that the Social Security trustees say the fund is solvent until well into the next century, how do you reconcile that? The question goes on, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Well, let me refer to uh, what our distinguished chairman said about demographic forces and uh, put a little specificity around that. We're all vaguely aware of something called the baby boomer generation. But I think very few of us are aware of the transformational nature of that generation. So let me give you a few numbers. The generation prior to the baby boomer generation, which is between 40, 1946 and 64, was a little over 49 million Americans. The baby boomer generation is 76 million Americans. So it begins with 50% more than the previous generation. But thankfully, that generation is also living much longer. So when Social Security started, one could expect at age 65 to live about 11 years or so, or 12 years. But early in the next century, thank God I might add, it is expected that the 65-year-olds will live close to 20 years at age 65. This then gives rise to a perfectly extraordinary increase, not simply in the total number of elderly, which is expected to double from 40 to 80 million, but an astronomical increase in that segment of the population over the age 85. It is expected to grow three or four times faster than is the young elderly, with the stunning result, if you want a picture of what America is going to look like in the next century, that not only by about the year 2020 will this look like a nation of Floridas, but we could easily have a situation where there are as many over the age of 85 as there are children under the age of five. Now this stunning uh, change demographically is going to put extraordinary burdens on the annual expenditures and on the payroll taxes of my children who are sitting here and I think it could be easily demonstrated, if we had the time, that the annual deficits that will come about as a result of this boomer generation are in the hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Now, you can't finance the unfinanceable. You can't sustain the unsustainable. And there was an old saying that if your horse dies, we suggest you dismount. And I would like to suggest to you that we are on a course here that is not sustainable. Now, the chairman gave some brilliant testimony to the Kerry Danforth Commission on entitlements. And you may recall, Alan, being asked by someone, what are the deficits that really matter? And do you recall saying it's the annual unified budget deficit because that's what must be financed? Now, I endless, endlessly hear people say to me, well, Peterson, what are you worried about? The trust fund is there, and that's going to be solvent until the year, whatever it is, 2029. I'm a collector of oxymorons, you know, like a powerful Secretary of Commerce, for example. Um, I think a trust fund uh, qualifies as one of the ultimate oxymorons. It is a hoax, it is a folly, because there's nothing in it but government paper. And I would have thought, Alan, that a useful constitutional amendment might be to uh, repeal the use of the word the trust fund, you know? <laughs> because then Americans would not be lulled into the idea uh, that there is no problem. So my answer to your question, sir, is it is broke. And it must be fixed. And if we wait much longer, the tax bills will become unsustainable. The cuts would then be draconian for the half of the people in America who really need Social Security. And since Rudman is needing me, I will not now advocate the affluence test. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Uh, Chairman Greenspan, question is, do you favor a balanced budget constitutional amendment, and um, why or why not? I've always argued that uh, what we have to do is balance the budget. And the way you do that is that uh, in the current environment and the current economy, you lower the rate of growth in expenditures because they are clearly on a current services basis, increasing at a rate which is in excess of the potential rate of growth in the tax base. Arithmetically, that leads you to progressively larger deficits, which incidentally cannot be closed by increasing tax rates because ultimately you begin to find that revenue falls as taxes go up. There is no substitute uh, to reducing expenditures. Uh, if I thought that a balanced budget amendment would significantly alter the ability of our system to do that, I would support it. My problem is I think that the Constitution is uh, an extraordinary uh, instrument of our society and our institutions, and I do not believe we should employ economic policy in the Constitution. I must say, however, that uh, what has been very clear to me is that the failure to pass the balanced budget amendment to a large extent has been a factor in the change in attitudes to come at this issue in a realistic manner. And I must say that uh, uh, while I have uh, concerns about uh, how this, uh, how a balanced budget, would have, balanced budget amendment would have interacted with all of this, uh, I have a certain suspicion that the discussion of that issue may well have contributed to what has been an extraordinary change in the attitude of the American people, the American Congress, and the American President towards balancing the budget. Not all of the uh, shift in the public's view in this regard is the result of the Concord Coalition, I regret to tell you. Thank you. Let me, Chairman, let me ask you this question about um, the feeling of many business people that conventional concerns of the Fed about inflation have been overrun by an entirely new competitive uh, range of forces in, in, in a highly competitive global economy. The argument goes that because of big increases in um, global competition and production and inc increases in supply, it's far more difficult to raise prices than in times past. Uh, and therefore, the Fed can afford to loosen and lower rates more than it has in the past. Would you? I wish that were so. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, without addressing the latter part of that question, let me address at least the economic parts of it. Uh, first of all, there is no question that there's been, there is some element of truth in the issue of the increasing globalization and hence the increasing competition has affected uh, the underlying cost structure of the United States in a favorable manner. However, the evidence very clearly indicates that while there is some significant impact on the cost structure of manufacturing, remember that all goods uh, are either agricultural or manufactured goods, and most of what we import is manufactured goods. The size of manufacturing in our economy is not very large. And while it is certainly the case that there are some services which are affected as a, from international competition, the combination of goods imports plus service imports which are competitive and the secondary interaction of the wage effects in manufacturing on the services area still does not come out to be an overwhelming impact on the underlying wage cost structure, which, as you know, on a consolidated basis is two-thirds or more 
of the total cost structure of the American economy. The interesting issue here is how then, if that is so small, do we explain what is clearly a significant degree of disinflation in the American economy, which effectively is greater than one would presume looking at mainly the elements of economic activity which we conventionally appraise ourselves of. In the Economic Club of Chicago speech I mentioned in my formal remarks, I try to address this issue a little bit more specifically because what is clear about what is keeping the rate of inflation down or more exactly what is facilitating monetary policies capability of keeping the rate of inflation down and indeed reducing it is basically a darker side of our economic processes and that is the gen generation of insecurity amongst a very significant segment of our workforce. As a consequence of the very substantial increase in technology which has accelerated the turnover of the capital stock to a very extraordinary agree, degree, the individuals who are associated with that capital stock indeed w must work with it will inevitably feel insecure and that degree of insecurity has in recent years very clearly induced a significant shift from a desire for increasing wages to job security. That particular process has been pronounced and very obvious. However, what is also obvious about it is that it is not and cannot be a permanent trend because as the degree of insecurity increases, human beings begin to eventually respond negatively to that sense and there's only a limit to how far that can carry. At some point in the future, I don't know whether it is several years out, many years out, we will no longer be looking at this trade-off where wage gains are being suppressed because of job insecurity. At some point, a rebalancing must occur, and at that point, wage gains will start to accelerate again and increase costs. Hopefully, at that time, inflation will be minimal, and therefore, those wage gains will be in real terms significant increases in standards of living and that's all to the good. But what is important to remember is that this particular phenomenon which is facilitating the effects of suppressing inflation uh, which monetary policy has the major role in is a transitional phenomenon. It is not something which is permanent any more than the process of international competition uh, is a permanently increasing set of pressures on prices. All I could suggest to you is at the moment, not necessarily in the period immediately ahead, but somewhere out there as we approach and get into the 21st century, if we ever believe that the issue of inflation is somehow been suppressed, cured, eliminated, uh, those of us at central banks, my successor and his or her successor, are going to have a terrible time dealing with it. So there are certain great myths out there which have uh, non-benevolent non consequences. I'm fearful that that one is one of them. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think you have a very rapt audience here, and what I suspect, if you can handle a few more questions, I think they'd love to. Uh, while you're drawing breath, I just want to thank some of the other uh, directors of the Concord Coalition who are here. Roger Brimmer of DRA, DRI, 
Gene Friedman, the retired chairman of Coopers and Lybrand, Bud Meyerhoff, and Tim Penny, former congressman from Minnesota. The CPI. Um, no one has yet tried to weave a CPI adjustment into the balanced budget plan. Uh, what's your thinking on this question? Should Congress legislate that adjustments, adjustments be less than the official index, or should we just wait for the people who put the index together to um, potentially change it over time? The consumer's price index is not a cost of living index, as the Bureau of Labor Statistics very succinctly says in all of its written literature. The CPI, by its very nature, overestimates the cost of living, and it is not an issue of merely inadequacy on the part of uh, the technicians and specialists at the Bureau of Labor Statistics to fail to capture the particular price problems. If you insist on having a consumer's price index, which does not get revised retrospectively because we have all of these contracts on which it is uh, uh, structured, then you cannot eliminate one very important bias, which is the fact that new products invariably fall in price in their early stages and then start to rise as they are becoming a more uh, 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 universally acceptable type of consumer good, for example. As a result, the consumer's price index invariably begins to pick up the price when it hits bottom and starts to rise, but all of that decline is not picked up and it cannot be picked up because you don't know the product exists until the price is already well down. If we were able to retrospectively reprice those products, meaning pick up all of these declines in new products, we would find that the measured consumer price index, after the fact and revised, would be on a significantly lower slope. Then, of course, there's the problem of the so-called fixed weight, which invariably, in the typical uh, example, is that uh, if you have a fixed weight of, say, uh, beef and chicken, and the price of beef goes up very sharply, people will eat chicken, and they won't be paying the high prices for beef. But those prices are in there. The beef price is in there and affects it. And there is one of the extraordinary events about economic statistics is that people really do try to move towards lower prices and you always see the shift towards lower priced goods. The consumer's price index cannot pick that up. As a consequence of this and a number of other technical problems, I don't care how much effort is put into the consumer's price index. You cannot solve this problem. Indeed, the technicians at the Bureau of Labor Statistics do an extraordinarily good job. They are first-rate statisticians. They put the consumer's price index together as about as good as it can be done, certainly better than anywhere else in the world. What they cannot create is a cost of living index. And if, as virtually all economists believe, the cost of living index is something related to the consumer's price index minus some fraction, if, as one must presume, the purpose of the number of various different uh, programs in the federal budget, which are supposed to be escalated by a cost of living index to hold recipients in real terms whole, then, as I've testified many times before the Congress, what we ought to be doing is to have a separate index, which is not the consumer's price index. It may not even be a true cost of living index, but endeavors better to capture the 
loss of purchasing power that truly is occurring with respect to a number of these programs as they move through the years. This would be affecting both tax brackets, which are indexed, as you know, and a lot of programs, and the amounts of money that would be, I hate to use the word saved, because effectively what we've got is an overestimation. It's not an issue of somehow saving something. The system overcorrects. It is not a reduction in entitlement programs or an increase in taxes. It's an endeavor to ad adjust for an overestimate. That strikes me as something which is very appropriate to be done, is long overdue, and I trust that somewhere along the line, sooner rather than later, the Congress implements it. Mr. Chairman, that was absolutely fascinating, and this has been a wonderful tutorial. Your, your uh, colleagues, though, unfortunately tell us that if we hit you with one more question, you're going to miss your plane. So with deep, deep appreciation for this evening, but mostly for everything you have done as an economic patriot, we'll close the evening with, with a very heartfelt round of applause. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure being with you this evening. I would stay for another hour. I thought this was fascinating.